From the heart of Prelites, the preprint highlighting service run by early career researchers and supported by the company Biologists, this is Spotlights. Hello and welcome to Spotlights, the Prelites podcast that highlights the stories behind the most exciting biological preprints, putting the spotlights on the early career researchers who spearheaded the preprinted work. My name is Matthew, joined by Rainier, and I'll be your host today. In this episode, we're joined by Papasha Day of the Riken Centre for Biosystems Dynamics Research in Kobe, Japan, and Fogena Karl and Girish Kali of the Centre for Organismal Studies in Heidelberg, Germany. Today, we'll discuss their preprint, Divergence Evolutionary Strategies Preempt Tissue Collision in Fly Gastrulation. Thanks for joining. Could you perhaps describe the start of the project, you know, that led to this preprint? I guess it starts in different points for all of us and also for the lab itself, because this work had been in the works for quite a long time um, from the PI level. Um, For Bipasha and me and Girish, I think we basically started working on this project relatively recently um, with kind of some of the foundations laid, but basically doing the work to actually get the concepts that were thought of on the on the paper, essentially. Yeah, so in that sense, the work on this this preprint has been going on for the last five, six years on and off. And yeah, we have been working on it. The the lab has been working on it, not us three per se. But mm-hmm. the lab has different people in the lab have been working on it and you know, some successes, lots of failures and whatnot. So it kept on, like, it it stayed in sort of our brain space, but never really picked up a lot um, until last, let's say, one and a half year or so. So that's when we started um, thinking about it more and more. Uh, Also getting more inspired from data from uh, Bruno's work and so on. So, yeah. I I just think that it's one of those... um really interesting examples of how work in the lab kind of culminates into something really amazing eventually. So these were like uh, individual pieces of the puzzle, which were there here and there. And it just kind of came together in the last one and a half year. So uh, when all the data was put into context and then, you know, we could do things based on those hints that we had. I think it just came together in the last one and a half years, but the concept and the idea behind it was already there somewhere, like the others said. I think also this was very collaborative because, um, I mean, we are also uh, working in close collaboration with Bruno and Pavel's group, right? So also there, uh, long going back, they had been in contact, had been discussing different sub- different topics, different concepts. Um, and so even though now we have two different papers, there's a lot of like achievements that they have come and then input from our side and it gets kind of balled back and forth um, for both of the papers grew, I think. Maybe I can ask then, um, since this um, is a product of a collaboration between labs in Germany and in Japan, how did that collaboration initially arise? Interesting question. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, I'm relatively new to the lab. So uh, what I understand is that uh, Stefan and Yuchun, they were, they know each other since grad school and they've been really good friends and kind of exchanging scientific information, feedback, etc. And the work is also kind of really sort of, um, if you put it together, like our, our lab is kind of more focused on Drosophila and then uh, Stefan's lab is like really looking in dipterans, all species, and really trying okay. to do comparative stuff. So that makes a very good combination, you know, um, not just the scientific part, but also the two leaders, the team leaders being really good friends, getting along, you know, being able to bounce off good ideas. So I guess um, that was a starting point, but there might be some stories that I'm not aware of. So <laughs> Irish and Verena could, <laughs> could add to that. No, yeah, basically that, I think that was the starting point. They have been thinking about different kinds of stories. So this paper is only, I would say it's only one of the, one of such collaborations. 
maybe I can follow up by, with that by asking, um, how do your two labs communicate with each other? Have you ever met in person or is it purely remote? We have recently met in person. <laughs> <laughs> this this year was the first time that I met Medina in person because I went for a conference in Germany. And uh, Girish, I wouldn't, I haven't met him recently, but I knew him from yes. long back. <laughs> so, so actually, Girish and I were kind of, I, I did my PhD from the Indian University where Girish had done his undergrad. And we met later on in conferences. Yeah. So I would say most of the work was done through Zoom and Slack. Um, and then once we were basically almost finished, Bipash and I met at the conference. And then also Girish and I, we visited the lab in Japan. Yeah, so there was this meeting of uh, Japanese Society of Developmental Biology, and they had um, uh, they had invited the German counterparts, so members of some members of German Society of Developmental Biology. So we went there as um, the delegation, so to speak, from um, <laughs> from the German side. And then while we were there, we were like, yes, we have to go and meet our collaborators. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, it's right that yeah, Verena pointed out, right? So most of the work was actually done in the time frame when we hadn't actually met each other. Yeah. So, and I don't think it was really a problem or a barrier. I would say it went off really smoothly and the communication was pretty good through Slack and Zoom. So yeah, I just feel that... Um, I never thought that this something like that can be possible without meeting somebody yeah. to work together just by connecting over Zoom. But I guess I have my personal experience that it's worked out really well. Before we move to the project itself, um, how did you three um, get into research on biology and developmental biology in particular? Yeah, uh, I guess for me, it was during my PhD. So... I have been uh, working more in, in cell biology and so on. And I, I had joined a lab which uh, works, which actually does focus on a lot of uh, embryogenesis uh, and so on, or Drosophila, early embryogenesis, gastrulation and things like that. But the lab wanted to take a slightly different um, approach using cell culture and stuff like that. So I was there to try and establish it, but that didn't work out. So then... I defaulted back to the lab's basics. And then that's when I started working with fly embryos. And yeah, that was sort of the origin story for me. <laughs> for me, also, it was during my PhD. So I actually, my background was initially in microbiology, but then during my P, I got really interested in cell biology. And during my PhD, I looked at um, cell shapes in only Rosophila embryo and how they're regulated. So that was my entry into developmental biology, although I was more looking at the cellular scale stuff and cell biology and using Rosophila just as a system. Uh, then uh, I think towards after I finished my PhD, I had this, um, I had an interest in going out from the cellular scale and to look at more global tissue scale forces and mechanics and development. And that's when I joined Eugene's lab. And interestingly, this was the project that he showed me as one of the ideas and I was really interested in it. And um, then eventually, you know, I followed it up here. Yeah. For me, I come from the more medical side. So I did biomedicine in the bachelor's. But I already in the bachelor's noticed that development was actually really cool. So I decided to focus quite early on development. Um, and so that's also during the master's, I ended up in Steffen's lab. And I continued because I thought the topic was really cool. Maybe I'm jumping forward slightly, but I was just wondering when you go to a conference, what's the most, what's the thing that gets you most excited about this story? And what do you tell people? Like, what are the main take home messages you, you'd say? I guess uh, one of the things um, to talk about is that it's it's a very um, nice deep fall, but that it's a transient one. So uh, so people get really excited about this because they feel that oh, 
you know, like we haven't heard of a transient fold anywhere else in different contexts. So, so that is one of the things that gets them excited. The other thing I think, which is kind of the highlight of this whole study is the comparative thing across species, across different Drosophila species, um, uh, Dipteran species. And that I think really puts the whole thing into context because, um, People are, of course, excited about the mechanics of this folding and, you know, like the role in Drosophila. But then when you tell them about the contrasting um, things in the other uh, detergent species, then it, it really gets them excited. So I think for me, these are the two things that um, the evolutionary perspective of this, if, of this particular fold and the transient nature of this fold. So these two things are kind of the unique ones that people are really excited about. And what got, what got you excited, like during the project itself? Like what was one of those findings that you were, you thought was particularly exciting while, you know, like while working on this, on this story? Um, there were many things. Um, I think one of the things for me was, um, if I have to just pick one, maybe it was really trying to mimic the chironomous developmental process in uh, Drosophila by changing the division orientation. That was uh, kind of cool for me because it was really like ectopically trying to do something in the fry that it normally does not do and then trying to sort of ask what, how does it deal with this now? Um, so you mentioned um, this project or this work had been going on for quite a while and you started working on it um, particularly in the past year and a half. Um, was there a particular breakthrough moment experimentally? I don't know if this counts or not, but so we were trying to induce a furrow, right, in the non non model uh, fly species. So this the species kind of looks similar to mosquito and so on, and uh, they have really eggs of the eggs look quite different from Drosophila, and they don't have the furrow, right? So we were trying to induce the furrow. And uh, we have tried a few perturbations in the past, but then we thought that, okay, maybe we can change a few parameters, tweak the perturbations a little bit here and there, and then we can see if, if we get a furrow or not. And we actually got a furrow. As it turns out, it was an artifact. <laughs> so that, I mean, it it was, in a, in a weird way, it drove us, it gave us a lot of excitement and kept us going for a long time. Eventually, we realized that, okay, it's it's an artifact and it was kind of hard to, you know, convince ourselves that, yes, it is an artifact. But then, yeah, eventually we also realized that there it th that those experiments also gave us indications about other things, other things that might be different between Drosophila and the, so this is the other species called Chironomus uh, uh, riparius. So between Drosophila and Chironomus, there are other differences which we can focus more on instead of trying our hardest to get a furrow. And um, so we, th that's when we realized that there are differences in how morphogenesis happens in the head domain. So that difference uh, turned out to be quite big between Drosophila and Chironomus. And that, as it turns out, when we did the quantification, it explains quite a lot of... Um, the difference between the two species, why one species requires cephalic furrow while the other doesn't, right? So that's something that in a way, yeah, kept us going, but then eventually we realized that we were on the wrong path and then we switched and got on the right path and here we are. So uh, when I asked uh, Bruno what he considered the future of his uh, project to be. He considered it um, not the end of the line, but the start of something new. Um, I wonder, do you consider your project's future to be um, in the same, the same in that regard? Um, do you consider it um, like the start of something new? Mm, I would say so, because there are already some things that we are kind of following up on. So, for example, we don't really know what happens to the cells that get into this furrow. Where do they end up? Because after the whole thing retracts, they go somewhere onto the embryo, right? So we, we don't really know eventually where they end up in the embryo during uh, morphogenesis. So that's something that we're already trying to do by um, kind of uh, 
a pulse chase kind of an experiment with uh, marking some cells with, you know, um, uh, not optogenetically, which is like uh, shining some light and then following up the cells later on and see where they end up. So that's one of the directions that we're taking. Yeah, I mean, it's like once we have established that this structure has some function, it makes a lot of sense to keep following it in different directions. So one would be like uh, Bipasha was saying, once you have the system where you can get rid of the furrow, you can ask how it affects sulfate specification in different contexts, right? Yeah, are there sulfates which are missing, which should be there, or you know, some ch fates are changed or what, right? Do you expect that that this will also lead to um, again similar collaborative work, or will you also will it branch into projects that might be more interesting to one lab than the other, or how how do you how do you see this collaboration continuing on this specific project, perhaps? I think usually how uh, I've seen it work in the lab is that independently we go ahead and you know have some interesting data and then in our common lab meets we show it to each other and then we find some common link that's interesting to both of us and then you know that that takes it forward and usually that's the case that when you are looking at something you will find something very interesting when you're comparing with the other species and then that's just fantastic it adds some new flavor to uh, just a drosophila centric study so yeah I, I guess it just depends on the data and it's full of opportunities yeah and uh, in addition to the project what does the future hold for you uh personally i am um i'm starting to apply for different pi positions because it's like i'm already almost seven years from uh, defending my thesis PhD, finishing phd so yeah i would say i'm already in that stage where um i'm trying to start my own lab uh of course the idea would be to try something similar look at different species uh, although i might go in a slightly different direction so that's some that's another project that i've been working on uh, looking at effect of temperature on uh, early embryonic development see what sort of defects we can uh, expect and what happens when you put fly embryos at high temperature so that's something i would follow up on but yeah basic gas relation is always interesting for me, I think this is, um, I'm relatively early in my postdoc uh, years, so it's just been two years for me. So I am also looking into other things apart from this. I mean, this was actually not my main project. This was just one of the projects. And uh, there are other things that I'm looking at where I'm interested in looking at um, how differences in material properties of tissues facilitate different kind of tissue folding events. So that's another direction that I'm looking into. And I am thinking of also kind of branching out a little bit, but eventually also looking for having my own lab in the future. Yeah. So I'm still in the middle of my PhD. So also for me, I think continuing a bit on this project, if there's a few things that are coming up, um, in the future, but then also uh, returning to one of the other projects that I also was working on. Um, and then, yeah, seeing, finishing the PhD and then the world's open. I was wondering maybe besides the technical hurdles, what, what were the more personal difficulties during, or just the frustrations during this project and how do you actually manage to keep your motivation, keep your spirits up? So I think that maybe I'm the one that had the most frustrations because so Girish mentioned that we had this artifact um, where we believed that we had the key to um, getting this uh, embryo to buckle um, or to make a furrow and we turns out that it wasn't. So kind of coming to terms with this, convincing your PI that this is an artifact, um, I think that was pretty tough. Um, and so in the end, basically the way that I managed to get out of it was, first of all, there was a lot of support in the lab. Um, and also, I mean, Stefan was wonderful, just, you know, he didn't really want to hear it. Um, and so I think the thing that we ended up 
kind of how we got out of it was to ask, what do we actually really need um, to tell the story? What is something that we really need to understand in order to, um, you know, make the statements that we want to make? And so for this, this is when the quantifications for expansion came up is basically to see, okay, we cannot artificially change plane of division in any way. But can we maybe just descriptively in the wild type already tell whether or not there's any effect um, or there would be an effect? And then we can recreate this in Drosophila where it's fairly easy to do. Yeah, for me, I guess it was uh, basically a lot of my manipulations are with injections. So um, injecting in the fly embryo and then imaging them. So I struggle quite a bit in that. Uh, because somehow the, um, uh, in our case, the concentration for the double strand RNA was initially, uh, I guess, not optimal. So I would get variable results and it was like, you wait for the whole day and then at the end of it, you realize, oh, the RNA did not work after imaging. So it was quite frustrating for me. And also the microscope that I was using somehow that period when I was using it the most, somehow it was giving me a lot of problems. So a lot of drift in the focus. And I was like, oh, the whole day wasted. I did so many injections and none of the images that I took are like, you know, good. So those were the frustrating points. But then, yeah, eventually it got better. I think it was a lot of support from the PI. I think that matters a lot because when you go and tell them saying things like, oh, you know, this is not working, that is not working. If you hear things like, oh, but you know, you you just need to do it and you just need to work harder, then it's it's even more difficult to deal with that frustration. But in my case, I guess I was really lucky where he would say things like, I, I hear your frustration or I understand that you're frustrated and, you know, let's get this done. And that helped a lot because I guess we're all we're all trying to motivate ourselves and we wouldn't be doing all this if we were not motivated. But it's about people around us really trying to see that and not judge us or misjudge us. So I think that really helped for me. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It, it, that, that sort of was the same point for, uh, for me and Verena. I think it was the same point where we thought that we had the effect that we were looking for, but as it turns out, it wasn't there. And yeah, Stefan was really understanding. Like, obviously, there are, there have been times, right, that he we were so excited about the data. We we showed it to him. It was quite convincing, and so on. And so he, I think, he also discussed the work, discussed the result with other people. And then it, when we were when we were going back to him, saying that look, I we know we told you this, but we think it's an artifact. And then it's sort of an embarrassment, right? That you have talked about something with full confidence and now you're going back and saying that, oh, maybe that that was just an artifact, right? And so we were trying to be a thousand percent sure that yes, it is actually an artifact. So yeah, that was the frustrating part, but then yes, help and support from others helped out. So my last question would be, so, you mentioned the importance of mentorship or also of being able to actually discuss things openly with your PI. I was just wondering what, in your opinion, makes a good lab, especially seeing that Girish is already, you know, wanting to set up his own lab and Pashi, maybe you are also in the future and Brenna, who, who knows you, you may also want to do so in the future. I'm just wondering what lessons do you take away from you know, working in what sounds like a really um, well-functioning lab? Uh, yeah, so I think it's communication. I think that this is something where um, uh, you really notice that for, from our side, Stefan really cares and he really takes the care to communicate properly how he intends things um, that he's kind of asking or how um, if we're having any personal issues or issues with how we're dealing with the data to basically be there as an open person to talk to without necessarily getting any judgment but more in the sense of this is something that will improve you as a scientist. So I'm taking the time to actually um, invest in you. Um, and also on, you know, not just on the scientific level, but also on the personal level to, to, ha to have a focus on 
uh, communicating well with your students. Um, I think that's very, very important. Yeah, to, um, I think to me also something similar, I guess, um, just another way of saying the same thing that Farina said is, I guess, at all levels being open to feedback. I think that's really important because <clears throat> even if as a PI, I'm not open to feedback, I guess we will hit roadblocks. So um, I feel that's really crucial. The other thing um, is um, I feel also um, to be able to resolve conflicts um, with respect. So um, I think I would like to sort of, you know, engage in a conversation and to resolve conflict together with a person with whom I'm comfortable will not be personally attacking me. You know, like I'm, I'm great. I'm okay with, you know, really strong critique from my paper, but not like for me, like you are wrong or you are not so good or something like that. So I think, um, yeah, to have a good lab, I, I suppose that I would like to create an environment where um, we can together resolve conflicts um, without disrespecting each other as people, you know. So, yeah, I think these two things are important to me. I guess the most, in my, at least in my opinion, the most important thing is mentorship. How good of a mentor you are to, to your students, how open you are to listening to them, to... To understand their problems, be it personal, be it scientific, be it uh, interpersonal communication between how, how it how they are feeling in the lab environment, how it is um, communicating with others in the lab, and yeah, being open and honest, I guess. And to round this off, uh, let's move away from the science a little bit. Um, let's imagine you've had a long day in the lab. Um, you've been at the microscope all day and you get back home. How do you wind down then? What do you enjoy doing outside the lab? Uh, well, um, so there are different things, I guess, depends on the day. <laughs> so um, I'm a foodie, so I like to go out and try new places and new cuisine. So that's one of the things. It really lifts my mood up. Um I am also fond of painting when I don't lo like to talk to people and I'm really upset. And I guess that's my mode of expression where I don't need to talk or sometimes I don't know how to express my disappointment. So that, that really helps me kind of um, settle down or loosen out a little bit. I also have, um, like I follow um, uh, this philosophy so I read books related to that. That helps me channelize my emotions in a better way. Um, yeah, so a couple of things that I do, but it's like, it's not like I do all of them every time. It's just depends on the day, depends on how I'm feeling. So I go to any one of these things and then it helps me really sort of get back on track. I mean, personally for me, I, to be honest, I don't think I tend to wind down at the end of the day it's more like at the end of the week and yeah so as far as possible I would keep going throughout the week and then yeah in the weekends we'll have different activities like maybe going for a hike or something or if it's if the weather outside is bad then playing board games or something like that so yeah or yeah or the other ways there is like Netflix <laughs> I think for me, um, I usually wind down on the way home uh, because I have quite a long bike ride. Um, and so I think that's usually very nice. Um, and then I guess just playing games, um, both on yeah, board games and also um, on the console and stuff. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing. I think, I think that more or less wraps it up. Vipasha, Vaveda and Girish, thank you for joining us. That's it for this episode of Spotlights. We'll see you next time. All our episodes are available on the Prelights website. And to keep up to date on each episode's release, follow us on X, Mastodon or Facebook, or register on our website. See you there. Mm -hmm.